I would like to introduce Danae Campbell from WorkSafe Victoria and industry panel members, Carney Short and Justin Jones. Welcome to the forum, Danae, Carney and Justin. Danae has been a member of the Major Hazards team at WorkSafe since 2004. She has a passion for assessing safety cases and feels very privileged to be in the regulator position where she gets to observe each Major Hazard facility's unique safety journey. Carney has been leading the development and execution of Origin LPG process safety strategy over the past nine years. Her team supports the 12 major hazard facilities in meeting their regulatory obligations and driving process safety improvements across 50 terminals and the supply chain. Justin is the Operations Director for Dow Chemical in Australia and New Zealand. Justin has a chemical engineering degree from the University of New South Wales and a 27 year career with Dow Chemical. Justin has held manufacturing, project management and process safety positions with roles in the USA, China and Australia. Today's panel discussion will explore the three P's of KPIs, practices, pitfalls and performance. During the session, there will be time for questions. So if you have a question for the panel, you can post it at any time throughout the session in the Q&A box on the right of your screen. But for now, I will hand it over to Danae who will facilitate this discussion. Hello and welcome everybody. My name's Danae Campbell and today we're gonna to be using the three talking points of practices and pitfalls and performance to talk about KPIs. And I'm incredibly fortunate to have with me today our two industry experts, Carney and Justin, welcome to you both. We're gonna be using the wonders of this, on this online IT platform. We're gonna be doing some live polling and we're gonna be taking your comments and questions. So stick with us, we're gonna have some high energy. We're gonna take us right through to the end of the session today. Now, all of you in Victoria know that I love a good analogy. So I brought with me today a bit of a conversation starter. Yes, it's a watermelon. Now, why is the regulator holding a watermelon? Holding a watermelon? Well, we'll get to that a bit later. But if you've already had a look at the resource hub, you'll know exactly where I'm heading with this. Now, I felt like the resource hub yesterday was a bit of a, a regulator intelligence step test. Even I forgot to click to the right to find the article associated with this session today. So if you haven't had yet had a look at the resource hub, please do so this afternoon. There's lots of great stuff in there. So let's start with our first question for our panelists. Carney and Justin, thinking of your careers today, how's this topic shaped them? Justin, why don't you start us off? Yeah, thanks, Danae, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So um, process safety and key performance indicators have had a big influence, actually, on my career at Dow. I was fortunate to join right before Dow started a program of 10-year um, process safety and EHS improvement goals. So in 1995, Dow publicly committed to a 90% reduction in uh, process safety incidents and loss of primary containment events. And so what they did after that was put in place all the management systems and all the KPIs to support those management systems. And uh, I basically grew up in my career uh, seeing those systems develop and, uh, and, and improve over time. And now I'm in a position where I'm more understanding you know, how those systems work and, uh, and how to respond as, uh, as KPIs change. But I'd say most importantly with what Dow uh, did back then is they really forced a mindset of putting safety first and production second. And that's been reinforced throughout the whole organization over, over more than 25 years now. Over and to you, Carney. Carney. Yeah. Um, thanks, Justin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're quite a baby compared to Dow um, in terms of our process safety management journey, but, but we're there, I think, uh, almost there. Um, I joined Origin just over nine years ago as a process safety engineer. Um, I'm recalling one of my first tasks was to improve, um, no, actually, to remove the paper-based MOC process for the LPG business, which we had at that time, and really start looking at developing process safety KPIs, even if they were on Excel spreadsheets. Look, um, it was a challenge to do this for 11 MHFs and over 40 sites across Australia and the Pacific but also the challenge being in a vertically integrated company like Origin, where we have so many different operating environments from energy retailing, exploration, production, power generation, even storage and distribution. We, we know from the get go that we have to, to have a standardized approach in terms of managing um, and reporting our process safety risks on those, and those KPIs, especially if we want to report them um, from the asset or the business level 
um, right to the board. So looking back, I think this has definitely shaped my, my career at Origin, especially in 2017, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was assigned to look at how we can improve and fully integrate some of the core process safety systems that we have and have that rolled up approach. Um, I feel that we were quite fortunate to be able to, to do this quite quickly because we had full support um, from many of the senior leaders, from the CEO, um, and, and, and really the, the MHF regulators, us having so many MHFs across the country, um, the name, you know, you guys have been quite pivotal in terms of driving this transformation for us and help us continuously improve and understand our risk. That's very kind of you, Carney. Now we'll move, before we move on to practices, I'm going to start our first live poll. Let that started and we're going to share the results straight away. I want you guys <coughs> to tell us where you are in your KPI journeys, your maturity. There's, there's four possible answers there and that'll help prompt some of our, our, our responses to you. So hopefully you can see that now. I can see it. I can see the results um, starting to fall through. So we'll move straight to practices. Now, um, thinking about KPIs, where would you recommend an organisation start their journey, Carney? I think it'll be highly dependent on, on the company. Um, as a start, maybe they could review what they already have in place. Um, for us, you know, we, we started with developing lagging KPIs based on incidents and some of those simpler compliance type KPIs because we could extract this quite easily um, from the HSC, from the maintenance operations dashboard. And we could also do um, a documentation review with our front lines and some of the key stakeholders. Now, I think as the organization matures, maybe the second stage would be to develop a, a more comprehensive set of um, KPIs based on emerging practice, industry standards. And again, this could be through a review of publications related to process safety indi indicators, which I believe is um, they're all available on the forums um, resource hub. So anything from CCPS, um, UKHSC, API 754, those would be my uh, recommendation today and you justin yeah i mean you know carney's raised a lot of good uh, good points there and the only ones i would i would add and from what i saw what dow had done was put in place these electronic um, supporting tools and things so for say incident tracking and follow-up of the actions uh, from incidents uh, we have electronic moc tool um, electronic document management tools all these sort of things went in place. They they both um, enable the management system to work, but they also then provide you the the measurements that become part of the KPIs directly out of those. And uh, the sooner you can get those sort of things in place, uh, you, the the better it is uh, to be able to really understand what's going on and improve. Yeah. So, Carney, you introduced the concept of compliance KPIs. What do you actually mean by this? Well, I think uh, it's a natural start, I think, for many for, for many organisations to start with compliance KPIs because the initial intent is to drive that improvement in terms of leadership um, and in-field behaviours, um, maybe with the focus of to establish that process safety culture, you know, and strengthening our first known weaknesses, um, like what Justin mentioned before, you know, focus, um, let's, let's focus on all those um, process safety systems and tools. So um, some, some compliance KPIs would be, for example, um, the number of completion of um, safety critical equipment, uh, preventative maintenance, number of overdue trainings, number of, number of MOCs open for over um, a year, for example. But I think um, we, we just have to be aware that compliance KPIs, they indicate conformance to agreed target and always good starting point, but they don't really provide as much insight into the effectiveness of the control. So we really need um, to dig into the records, to verify the adequacy of implementation. And for us at Origin, we've, um, we've supplemented this with um, assurance and learning from incidents. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, Justin? No, I'd, I'd agree with what Carney has said there. I mean, yeah, the, the uh, compliance indicators are, are the basic, uh, you know, mechanical integrity, safety impairment, uh, safety system uh, interlock testing, uh, that sort of thing, and then and then you want to move to more management system uh, measures after that. That's that's the way I see it. Okay, look, let's um, let's have a look at, at the results of our live poll to come up. What can I see? So everybody, forty eight percent for I've got a decent set of initial initial KPIs, but making them more relevant. I think that's the journey we saw a little bit today with um, Lucas's Turnus, Lucas 
Lucas Turner's presentation and even Brett Maher. I, I thought they were both great presentations and, and showed that journey aspect. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, they're nodding. Yes. Yeah. Plums in line. <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> it's a good old laugh. Yeah. Right, look, I think we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Well, everybody was meant to get a little bit of a thing to say in each part of the session. So I think um, for the regulator, when you're starting off with KPIs, I think the journey starts right back at safety case outline stage. Uh, the safety case outline reference document does briefly talk about um, safety case demonstrations and assurance. I suppose one of the, the key things for the regulator where we see us, especially in first round safety case rounds, is, 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 is quite immature KPIs, quite immature assurances. So if you're right back at the start of the journey, which we know in Victoria about 20% of the, our facilities are now, it's quite important at the safety case outline stage to think about fleshing that out. And of course, listening today to, to people like Carney and Justin have actually lived that life and, and, and um, things like that. So we'll move on to, to governance. Now, um, panelists, why is establishing governance structures uh, early important? Um, Carney, you want to start us off? Yeah, I think for us, um, the opportunity for management to intervene <clears throat> in terms of having some corrective actions through performance goals and or targets on each of the KPI, it uh, ultimately forms part of the business assurance model, right, for safe operation. So um, it, 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 it really would differ from one organisation to another, um, but it typically would be a multi-level approach. Like, so for example, um, at Origin, we typically have three to four levels of governance structures, starting at the site or the regional level, and then at the business unit level, um, the divisional level, and finally the board level. Um, the frequencies for this governance as well may vary um, weekly um, at a site level because ultimately, you know, they've got the responsibility to act um, quickly um, on, on making sure that those KPIs are meeting um, the targets. Um, the frequency can also vary to monthly or quarterly as you go up the up the level. And Justin, do you have anything to add on that one? Yeah, I, I, I think probably touching on some of the same points as Carney uh, has raised, uh, you know, I think a lot of the governance structure relates to having some independence um, between the different groups that are that are really monitoring and looking at the um, at the performance. So, uh, you know, at Dow, we have a similar approach where you have the business, you have the geography, and we have the corporate functions and they they somewhat give that uh, level of independence when it comes to looking at what a particular um, production facility is doing and how it's performing uh, and, and it also enables this comparison across all the all the plants within the uh, within the company so then we can identify outliers and really focus uh, resources on getting those plants you know back into line again so all that needs to be obviously fully you know documented and 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 backed up with um, with corporate policy um, means of communication escalation um, and and tracking and managing um, any compliance issues that are identified yeah I, I think for, for me personally from a regulator perspective there is a massive difference in governance maturity between a, a multinational that demands it of a, a smaller like Australian site compared to a, a what I call a standalone MHF in the, it's, it's grown from the grassroots in Australia itself where they have, they have a local board, local management, local everything, and they're entering the, the MHF regime for the very first time. We've tried to, in the resource hub, put some, um, I think, two pointers, uh, two resource um, references around governments, and one's actually not related to MHF stuff at all. It's, it's the ASIC reference on the corporate government's task force on non-financial risk. And I actually think it's a great place for local boards to start to think through some of the, the key points there on, um, and then put your process safety spin on it using your, your process safety professional, which you obviously employ uh, as part of your brand new MHF and, and things like that. And then there's another one, which is the OECD uh, corporate governance guide. It's the process safety for senior leaders. I just love that one because it creates a common language between um, you know, senior leaders, boards and, and process safety individuals to talk about this stuff. And that's why I put that one as a reference in, 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 in today. So let's move on to talk about pitfalls. And we're going to introduce another live poll. Now we're going to share the results straight away. And 
basically this is for you to tell us and we're going to have some opinions too what elements of your management system are the most challenging to measure and if you do have another because there's there's seven or eight on the list and another please start putting that other in the comments box so we'll get to that during the comments and questions time so Justin let's kick off with some um key pitfalls what were some of the key pitfalls with regards to, to both building your KPI structures anything in governance just just anything at all that you wish if you had your time again you'd do a different way yeah, it's a, it, I mean, again, it probably depends a little bit on the on the actual organisation, the, the uh, size of the organisation, and and what supporting functions and everything exists. I think, you know, one of the one of the pitfalls would be making your your KPI so complicated to measure that it that it takes a lot of your available resources to actually make the measurement, and and to the point where you don't have people to, uh, you know, actually improve uh, what you need to improve. So it's somewhere there's there's this balance around around resources. I think that needs to be needs to be managed. Um, and then the other one is obviously, and you've got the watermelon there, but is that uh, you know choosing the KPIs that that actually reflect you know what's going on underneath, um, or having the systems in place to get to that um, is obviously critical because you know we can we can all choose measurements that on the surface uh, you, you know someone checks an action says it's done yeah it all looks great um, but you don't you maybe don't really know what's going on so that's obviously a, a major pitfall if we've got those systems in place yeah i suppose that is a great segue into our watermelon thank you justin for bringing that up so i did write myself some notes on the uh the beauty of the watermelon let's see if i can uh, remember that i think the the key thing for me for the the watermelon effect is is um and uh just for the reference we put the icme reference in um, but if you don't actually have the chemical from the chemical engineer, but if you actually don't have access to that, you can go back to the original white paper by Graham Ellis and request that from that website directly, and that will get sent to you to for free if you're not a, a member of ICME. But I think the key one for me is is that a pit a, a pitfall out of that was um, potentially measuring things that are easy to measure out of databases, and then not not using your intel on on or your your spidey senses, I call it, on where you're having near misses. Or things like that and adjusting those KPIs. So what do you guys think about your KPIs um, needing to be reviewed and how often something like that should happen? Carney, you have an opinion there? Yeah, again, I guess today that is um, dependent on the organisation. You can um, have a set time frame to review the KPIs, whether it's on a monthly basis or, a, or that's probably too frequent, maybe six monthly or yearly, really depending on the organisation. But for us, many of the triggers to review the KPIs have come from many of the governances that we had across those various levels. Um, finding from audits and insurance, incident investigations could also trigger, um, trigger the KPIs because at the end of the day, we're looking at performance of safety critical controls and those performance of safety critical controls um, sometimes could, uh, often could come from the um, you know assurance audits incident investigations. Very good. Now let's have a look at some other pitfalls. Now, looking at my notes. Uh, now, being realistic when the KPI is off track, Justin, I, I know you had some comments when we were talking last week. Um, what would you like to talk about today? Well, I think, you know, obviously you've got to try and understand what's led to it being off track. Um, that's, that's, that's one of the, the key things. And then, uh, and then be realistic about trying to get it back on track. And, um, you know, that, and again, that there can be multiple levels to that. You know, I'm fortunate to work in a company that's got a lot of defined processes to how to, how to deal with this. So we have a kind of escalation compliance review process as you find something off track to get it to, to get it back back in track, and that would depend specifically on which KPI it was um, as to what action you might need to take. Um, but you know, as the as a leader of people working on these things, you need to provide them the support, the resources, and the understanding to help get uh, get things back on track. All right. Well, let's look at the results of our poll now. So, what's it saying? It's saying, by my view, forty percent of people find critical operating procedures most um, challenging to measure. Carney, how do you do that in your organisation? 
That's a good one. It is. It is. Um, we don't actually have many KPIs on safety critical operating procedures. I think the only um, we have um, the KPIs that we've got would be around the review dates. Um, so obviously, a decision or a review was made earlier on to determine. You know, we've got so many different operating procedures standards. We have to determine which of these um, operating procedures are safety critical and. Um, uh, for us to be able to do that is have uh, to define what safety critical means. Um, so coming back to the KPIs, uh, safety critical procedures in date is probably one of the KPIs that we're looking at. But again, that's only a conformance KPI. Um, it doesn't really tell us the effectiveness of the KPIs. Um, and hence, we should be able to do, um, we should do that verification or assurance exercise, uh, looking at safety critical procedures and linking linking that back to the competency or the training because at the end of the day the competency um, supplements the um, safety critical procedures. And Justin, does Dow do anything differently than, than ours in this case? No, not a lot differently. We, we certainly have the same measure around you know procedure review dates and everything like that, but we also attempt to measure procedure use. Um, it's, it's again, it's not easy. Uh, you know so certain procedures will be you know, designated critical and they'll they'll be expected to be um, filled out, recorded and retained. So they're at least available then for um, you know audit and review. Um, to, to try and determine procedure use, but it's not it's not a simple task to do that. And um, and I'd say I'd put procedures and um, permit to work or safe work permit um, audits in in a similar similar category. And that's they're quite challenging to to really you know measure. Um, a lot of that we're doing in in a in a corporate audit sense where we have an independent team come in and do a complete audit of a facility, and they may allocate you know one or two people for half a day to try and really dig into these systems um, but that's that's you know fairly infrequent um, that's not every month or anything like that so it's a combination of the facility doing it themselves and then these corporate audits um, it's how we're doing it and it's not perfect yeah I'll, I'll, that's great I really think it's worth at this time uh, drawing people's attention to a couple of the references in the in the resource hub guide we put out um, just this, this past 12 months, the ICME have brought out, and I'll get the words right, the supplementary KPI for both permit to work and, and pressure relief devices, or pressure relief devices was in 2019 now, and permit to work in, in, in 2001. And I think what we could tell today, Trish, if you're online, is that we'll probably need to write the next one on critical operating procedures, because that's where um, Australia is telling you they want some advice. So if you haven't started work on that one already, I, I think that's a, that's a key one. Uh, followed by MOC, I'm sure that one's on the books already. But what I really love about these supplementary guides put out from ICME, especially the permit to work one, is it talks about the life cycle approach of permit to work, and and therefore it, it it talks you through the importance of the life cycle and different types of KPIs that could be put on different parts of the life cycle in order for you to diagnose issues just monitoring stuff like that and not saying you should use all of them because that that's just complete overkill but but you'll know your organization you'll know it best you'll know where perhaps the, the certain parts of the life cycle are weaker than others and you can test it using those KPIs so that's why I thought that guide is is a real great reference now we're going to open up to your comments and questions now Yvette have we had any comments on other or have we got any questions coming through let's 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 bring Yvette online welcome Thank, thank you, uh, Danae, and thanks oh, for leading such an interesting discussion so far. Um, yes, we do have some questions coming through, and, and just a reminder, um, people can submit their questions via the Q&A box. Um, so the first one, I might throw this one to you, Carney. Um, How do you differentiate between corporate KPIs and KPIs that are MHF specific? Uh, some comments on integration of the two would be appreciated. Yeah, it is. Um, it's 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 quite challenging. Uh, it's um, it's one of the um, I, I guess from experience uh, working at Origin where we have that multi 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 layer uh, multi layer. Um, not all of the KPIs from each business units are of interest um, to corporate or to the board. Um, and the way we manage those KPIs are quite different as well, from a site level to a BU level to a board level. So all the businesses, um, the, the three main uh, businesses where process safety risk are, um, are prominent, 
we, we, we got together through the um, Origin Process Safety Working Group and develop 11 process safety KPIs that we would roll up all the way from the site level to the board. And some of these KPIs would be um, safety critical training, um, preventative maintenance, uh, um, assurance activities, so um, um, internal audit findings. Um, yeah, so those are the three main um, uh, three main KPIs, but we've broken them into, um, so for example, maintenance, we would have broken them into preventative maintenance and, and, and corrective maintenance, and just looking at completion rates of all of those KPIs. Thank you for that answer. Uh, the next question, I might throw this one to you, uh, Justin. Uh, if your management is not interested in KPIs, how do you get them engaged? Um, well, actually, in, in the uh, in the company I work for, they're kind of forced to be <laughs> forced to be interested um, because uh, you, you know we have a certain processes for say a, a production leader of a facility, uh, you know, basically has to pass a test if you like before they'll be um, put in the role. So, um, you know, they've got to demonstrate um, that they have an understanding of all the key process safety risks for their facilities, how they're being measured. Um, and they'll be, ex you know, and their expectations for th for that to be reported up through their business, um, and also back through the corporate functions. So, uh, you know, someone who's not interested will be found out um, at some point and moved on. Is the uh, is the way I would uh, I would put it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, now, Danae, I might ask you this next one. Uh, with reference to the earlier presentation by Dr. Ray about the nature of assurance, how do you know if you are measuring the right things and if all this activity is adding to safety at a facility? Oh, look, tricky one. I actually didn't get the opportunity to listen to Drew. I was going to listen to him tomorrow in my own time, uh, but I've definitely am across his, his work. Uh, the core premise, you go back right back to the basics of what you're trying to achieve with, with a safety case. You, you, you know, as well as getting a license to operate, you're trying to understand some very, very basic things. You know, what could go wrong? How bad could it be? What causes that bad thing to go wrong? And what are you doing to stop it go wrong, essentially? So if, if you go right back to basics and that, that, that core one, those barriers, those controls, what stop it from going wrong? And then finally, how do you know what you're relying on is actually going to work? And that's where we sit today. We're having this discussion. We've had Lucas, we've had Brett. We've obviously got Drew with a completely different point of view. That, that, that's great. We need these, these critical discussions happening in this country. So in, 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 knowing, in you knowing what you're relying on, you just connect that to KPIs. That's your KPIs. That's what the regulator wants. <laughs> You know, we want the other three things to it. We, we really, whatever you're relying on, we want you to be right across it. We want you to know it works. We want you to know it's available. It's dependable. It's functioning. Yeah, we walk into the control room and we go, what are you really relying on? And, and if the clear discussions come out, you know, we walk away as, 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 as happy regulators. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, actually, at this point, um, Danae, I will hand it back to you just to continue the discussion. That's, that's, that's great. Yvette, well, look, we're going to go back. We're going to talk about performance now. We're going really well in our timings in this discussion today, uh, panel. So, Carney, now your organisation, I'm aware, has invested quite a lot in data and analytics. What was the key steps and drivers behind this? Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, Danae, it, it is that um, desire to have a standardised approach um, be, because of the nature of the business, right? Um, we, I, I think without support from the business, without support from IT, we won't be able to pull all of the information that we needed from 20 other systems, 40 different interfaces. And I, we're, we're talking about um, across origin as today, we're talking about 1000 KPIs. Um, so there's, there's no way we could do that manually and, and hence the investment in IT structure is really, um, we really need to get there. And is it as simple as um, you're purchasing different pieces of software for different things, or is it a specially purpose-built software that's drawing all those out? Yeah. Um, yeah, it requires some internal expertise. Um, as I mentioned before, when when we um, my manager at that time um, set up a specific role, um, integrated systems role, where I was leading a team, and we have um, a, you know a systems engineer working across. Um, 
different parts of the organization, collecting the information, um, and, uh, and also developing a um, automated dashboard so that we can actually withdraw um, all of the data, all of the information from this central data warehouse. Um, yeah, so it's not it's it's not overnight. It's not easy. Um, it took us a good um, two three years to to have it in place. And 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 Justin, how's Dow managed its data? Yeah, in in a similar way. So as I mentioned before, we're fortunate that we've had the in house resources to build all these systems that we use and then that you know the, the data is being collected there in the various databases whether it be moc uh you know main, maintenance document management uh you name it there's all there's all those databases and these days with tools like power bi and that and some smart people they're able to now pull all that together from all those sources to create uh, dashboards and everything like that so yeah, it, it's it's vastly improved, and and I you know to some of our point before talking around permit to work and procedure use, I think there'll be more opportunity with technology going in the next five or ten years. We're starting uh, now to use um, uh, tablets, in t intrinsically safe tablets, in in some of our larger sites for for permitting and procedure use. So that that will enable more automated data collection uh, for some of those um, management systems as well, and, and then it, it hopefully lead to improvements in those. Okay, and Justin, we'll stay with you. We've got a, a tricky question for Oyana that. Do you think your metrics have got to the point where you can show a correlation between your leading KPIs and your actual site performance now? Uh, this is a, it is a tough question. It's a, it's a bit of a yes and no answer. So. In in the in the big picture of the whole company and all the all the, the plants and everything that exist and the total number of um, process safety incidents or loss of primary containment events that that occur in the, in the, in a big set from the from the company, the answer is yes. You know we we look at the improvement in the management systems and the KPIs over a big uh, you know long period of time 20, 25 years now, and you can see a dramatic. Uh, reduction in the number of those incidents along with the improvement in those systems um, over that time. We're not at the point though where we've got the magic uh, you know, ingredients to say, oh, our, our KPIs are a true leading indicator that these five plants are the ones that are most likely to have the next process safety incident. We're, we're trying to find that, but we, uh, we have not found that yet. There's, there's some, some correlation there at that individual plant level, but there's, it's not, um, not that not that strong. And Carney, so fortunately, is there anyone... go on, <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, um, I mean, you know, that's, for us again, um, with Origin, we're probably still quite new to this. Um, probably in the last five years, there's been a really, um, you know, improved uplift in terms of uh, monitoring performance of um, safety critical control, so by other KPIs. Um, we we have information available to us, um, you know, on a, a, a real-time basis, right? So the um, the dashboard provides a sort of like a one-stop shop where um, during an MHF audit, for example, you know, we don't have to go through various systems to look at, oh, what's the training, you know, how's everyone doing at training? How's, what's our maintenance records looking like? It's all via the dashboard. And and for us, that's, you know, that's the journey that we've been, that we've been through over the last three, four, five years. But as Justin mentioned, to um, in in terms of reducing process safety incidents, um, it, it's it's on a downward trend, but it's probably not where we want it to be um, at that stage. Um, and we're hoping that um, with further work um, in terms of this um, automated process safety journey, um, maybe a transition to Power BI as well, like what Justin has mentioned, um, we could look at trending and see you know where all the gaps are. Um, in terms of um, looking at uh, focusing on um, what safety critical equipment we need to focus on, um, can we expect that there will be, um, you know, failures or gaps in these areas? Uh, what, what what can we expect next? I think that's a challenge. Very good. Well, thank you for that great discussion, Carney and Justin. There's there's one thing I suppose um, the regulator, uh, me as the regulator, wanted to add at this point in time. I can't actually have much comment around Power BI or or data and system, we can definitely see the growth and maturity of organisations such as yourself in, in using those 
but we don't prescribe or, or note any 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 software really that's not not our role i suppose a key step i want to bring up at this point of time and i'll i'll read off my notes in a minute because i want to get the words exactly right a key step of maturity for us if we talk about kpi performance and is to understand is when sites finally really understand the difference between performance monitoring and risk control rather than just res recording the result of a, of a functional test and I, um you know the former is an assessment of the ongoing effectiveness of the control where the ladders are checked the, the control you know conforms to its design criteria so i suppose some examples here you know you typically have a high level trip say it's set at 95 percent if it trips at 97 it fails it's a fail to, you know, fail result if you're testing it every year however you're finding you know one out of three over a longitudinal look are, are, are failing you know that that's that's that going from that functional test look to that performance monitoring sort of look and you begin to question the design base of the control and i suppose earlier we talked about you know how how can we you know, performance monitor operational procedures and i'm very fortunate one of my colleagues wrote me a great example which i'll, I'll share on the panel today so in the case of a procedure for an example a functional test you walk so typical functional test the regulator does you walk into a control room and ask an operator what would you do if an alarm went off you know what order would you do that we've been given this uh, critical operating procedure what order would you do this test and we just you know immediately test their knowledge type thing however from a site viewpoint because we're just doing a single sample on a single day you know your performance monitoring could be the equivalent of if we we did the same you know if in terms of our leadership walk arounds we did the same and you know uh, we want nine out of ten to get it right the first time you know so I know a lot of um, organisations and where a lot of you have what's called these these health checks, these management walk arounds, but, but um, you know, thinking of that next step of just the, the, the daily functional test is a longitudinal view. I don't know if, if uh, you, Carney or Justin, have a, have a comment on this or, or who wants to go first? Um, no? No, Justin? Justin. Oh, I can um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's right. um, I mean, just echoing to what you said there, Danae, it is true. It is like uh, what, when when we talk about safety critical operating procedures, that's probably one of our biggest um, grey area. You know, we're, we're, we're constantly trying to improve, um, trying to streamline as well the um, safety critical operating procedures so that, you know, at the end of the day, it's not for the people that are sitting up, um, you know, on the corporate ladder. It's someone, it's for the front line because they're going to be using those procedures and they need to know what are some of those um, safety critical steps or what are those pass fail criteria, right, within those procedures that's going to prevent them from getting hurt, that's going to prevent, you know, um, a leak of um, um, product, loss of containment of, of product. Um, it's um, yeah, it's a it's a tough one, and so I think with us, we 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 always back it up with um, safety critical task observations. A lot of the sites would do at least two, three a month. Um, we've introduced uh, what we call a life saving um, um, life saving controls, um, and even critical controls um, in relation to you know some of the hazards and um, looking at barriers and having those conversations right up front um and and really the authority to stop work if um things are not safe oh, cool now we'll move to questions we'll call a bit back there are you online and have we got questions um now i've got a question i'll get each of you to answer so um we might start with you justin so uh which kpis are most effective in your organization and just pick three we'll start with you justin well <laughs> That, that's a really tough question. We, we do look at a, at a lot of KPIs, um, so it's, it's really hard to narrow it down to just three because, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, uh, I, I really struggle there. We, we have KPIs for all our different elements of our management system, um, and you know, I, I could, we could nominate uh, KPIs for each one of those. Um, you know, at, but again, at the most basic level, I guess it's 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 ones around um, mechanical integrity. Um, it's it's procedure use to to try and capture that administrative control where we've got that in place, um, and then testing of our safety instrumented systems. I mean, that they would be the three I would choose, I guess. And how about yourself, Carney? Um, yeah, as uh, Justin mentioned, so uh, pretty pretty tough to choose three. I think it just depends on the business as well. But for us, uh, we we identified there were gaps in terms of assessing risk when whenever we need to defer a safety critical maintenance or whenever um, a safety critical equipment is impaired during testing or 
or operation. And we didn't know how to really um, do this quite well, I think, right um, in the beginning. So we've introduced uh, a more robust um, operational risk assessment and developed some KPIs um, to look at, um, you know, how often do we have to defer a safety critical maintenance? You know, how often does uh, equipment break down from as a result of testing and, um, and operation? So for us, um, uh, th that's probably one of them. Um, the other one is, um, uh, the other two Justin's already mentioned. So I think for, for us, maintenance is quite a big um, um, sector or area that we're focusing on. So there's a lot of KPIs in this. And MOC, MOC is the other, uh, management of change is the other one. There's and Danae, your top three. <laughs> My top three. Oh, look, I, I, I think some of the, the more, Obvious ones that the regulator can easily grasp are obviously the, the equipment ones around equipment and maintenance. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we, we have an emerging knowledge skill base too on how to, to critically access um, um, operational procedures. It's something we're, we're maturing and learning on, so that's something. And in, in, and and even um, I think we're, we're, we know a lot about permit work. We're still learning about how to really look well into management of change because we, as I said, we can tell if a system's working, but but we we sometimes struggle to assess ourselves if it's working well. So, so yeah, that'd be the ones that, that I'd pick. Yeah. Great. Thank you for sharing all of you your top three. Um, now, just next question. I might throw this one to you, Justin. How do you avoid encouraging the wrong behaviour with metrics and KPIs? Yeah, I, I guess it's it's partly uh, trying to choose the right KPIs, um, and then also partly on how you follow up um, if you know if there's an issue with the KPIs. And yeah, you know, I guess one of the the classic ones, and it goes back to Danae's watermelon effect, uh, would be closure of action items, um, where in, you know people can have an action item and they can do some half-hearted type effort to close it out by the due date. Um, it all looks good. When you when you check your metrics um, for action items closed on time, um, but you know behind the scenes it's the the work's not getting done. Um, so you know for that sort of thing we need to have um, some checking in place, some validation that those um, those actions have actually been done properly. That needs to be built into the management system, and uh, the people that are assigned those actions need to understand uh, you know that it is maybe okay to extend an action item. We're, we're much um, more happy to extend it rather than close it out when it should not really be closed out. And uh, and that comes down to the culture of the leadership, I think. Okay, now, Connie, this one is directed at you. Uh, what platforms worked well for your data analytics? Was the platform selected for you or the end user was part of the selection process? Sorry, what was that um, again, Yvette? What, which platform yep. worked for what, us? What platforms worked well for your data analytics? Um, I probably would have to take that one offline um, if, if to, 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 to give more information. Um, but for us, um, it's, it's, it's not so much just the platform, it's around <clears throat> making sure that uh, before we even embark on those KPIs, we're going to make sure that, you know, all of the existing process safety systems and the tools that we've got, um, you know, they're capable of churning out or, you know, we're, we're capable of drawing data, meaningful KPI data from those systems. And I think at the end of the day, the platform, you know, we, um, you know, we rely on, rely on um, external consultants as well to help us develop, um, two external consultants to help us develop um, those um, platform for the automated um, process safety dashboard, where we gather a lot of the data from this massive data warehouse. Um, but I'm happy to, um, to give the specifics because I wasn't really, I don't really know the name of the platform. Um, <clears throat> happy to give that um, detail offline. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Carney. Um, well, that actually means that we've almost reached our limit. So, Danae, I'm going to pass back to you just to wrap it up. Thanks, Yvette. Now, well, look, we've had a, a great session today. We've, we've, we've talked all about the from practices, pitfalls and performance. And I'd really like to thank our panellists today, Justin Jones and Carney Muniadi Short. Thank you for all the rehearsals, putting up with my, my poor humour occasionally. And uh, don't forget to visit the Resource Hub. If you haven't already, there's some great stuff in there, some great links. And to be honest, we've barely touched on some of the content that's in there today. 
there are so many interesting documents in there. But that's all we do have time for today. So I said, thank you to Abet. Thank you to my moderator, Andrew, in the background. Thank you to Carney. Thank you to Justin. It's definitely time for afternoon tea. We've got a well reserved rest. And I'm fortunate to have brought mine with me. And Justin, no, I'm not going to eat this on live TV. <laughs> I'll leave it here. <laughs> Thank you, Danae, Thank you. Carney and Justin. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.